My name is Thomas Surbuk and also known as Dr. Z. And I'm Ellen Stofan, also known as Dr. E. Welcome to another episode of Easy Science. So we're here at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and this is an amazing exhibit that I'm so excited about. It's called If Then She Can, which is all about if you can see it, you can believe it, and we want girls to know they can. They can become scientists, engineers, and technologists. We have 120 3D printed orange plastic statues, all of women who are currently right now changing the world in science, technology, engineering, and math. It's the largest group of statues of women ever brought together by the Lida Hill Philanthropies. But what is really important to me is in the few weeks we've had this at the Smithsonian, we've had many of the women who these are statues of here with us. And I had an opportunity to speak with Dr. Kelly Corrick today, who I know for over 20 years because 17 years ago or so, she graduated with a doctorate and I happened to be the PhD advisor and I followed her career from the Smithsonian. She's currently working at NASA headquarters. Hey Kelly, it's just wonderful to see you here and you being honored. One of the statues that we're looking at, you were a student of mine and graduated 17 years ago with a doctorate. What happened since then, Kelly? Well, thank you so much, Thomas. Yeah, the last 17 years has been so exciting. You've done a variety of things. Went first of all to the Center for Astrophysics, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I did a postdoc and studied stars that explode, as well as jets coming out of galaxies. Then moved on to start building instruments and focusing on the sun which was really one of my first loves and work I've done with you as a graduate student. I worked on NASA's Parker Solar Probe, the mission to touch the sun, and was part of that instrument suite that was able to fly into the corona for the first time last year. Just wonderful. So you, of course, built one of the hottest instruments actually ever built for space research, uh, an instrument that's on the outside of the heat shield. Tell us what's the most important thing you figured out in your own research that relates to that instrument. Right, the things that I figured out specifically was to look at coronal mass ejections or these billions of tons of material equivalent to 80 million school buses racing towards us at millions of miles an hour and how they're different. And we have saw for the first time the closest, the birth of these CMEs with Parker and how they evolve and how they are a little different than what they look like at Earth. And so that's why we need to go all these different vantage points to really understand space weather. You know, I have to tell you, I, when I was a grad student and a postdoc, I dreamed of those data. I'm just so proud that you are able to make those first observations close to the sun of these amazing phenomena, which of course shape astrophysics. What is your advice to young girls about potential careers in science? Stay curious, figure out what problem you want to solve, and then ask the questions that are going to help you solve that. Work together, Find someone who inspires you, surround yourself with people who are curious and interesting, and you'll do great things. You being honored as part of that exhibit means just a lot to me personally, because I'm so proud of you, of what you have achieved. Well, thank you so much. That was such a great conversation with Kelly. And earlier, I got to speak with Dana Bowles. I know Dana from uh, the work that she does at NASA, and I want to tell you, what she's really helping us with is how to communicate science, not only individually to young girls and learners of all ages, but also rebuilding our entire websites that communicate science to large audiences worldwide. Dana, I'm so excited to have you here today at the Air and Space Museum, and I'm so inspired by your statue. What is it like to see yourself in orange plastic? Oh, <laughs> it's... Uh... It's really weird, <laughs> it's really strange. I never thought I would see a statue of myself, much less a full scale size one. And being part of the whole collection is just an amazing experience. And meeting the other ambassadors, I'm so honored to be part of such a group. And what's your story? How did you get inspired to go into space? I was born with this disability. And so when I was younger, I thought that the best job in the world would be to be in space where I could float around and I wouldn't need the chair and I didn't have to look up at people and it just felt like a perfect job to have. When I was younger I wanted to be an astronaut and as I got older I focused more on engineering because I realized that I depend a lot on equipment to be independent from my chair and my arms and especially equipment to drive my van. 
So based on all those things, it just felt natural to choose engineering. You've had some really interesting roles at NASA. Can you tell us about a few of them? My very first job with NASA was at the Kennedy Space Center. I was a payload safety engineer, and that was an incredible way to be introduced to NASA. I mean, the excitement of working for America's space program, and we used to approve everything that went up on the shuttle or the expendable launch vehicles, the rockets, and I loved everything about it. Just learning about the International Space Station and working on the Mars Orbiter, it was just, Excellent. And then a few years later, I transferred to Ames, and then I worked three years as an ISS payload logistics lead. And now I was working with the project that would put up biological experiments on the International Space Station. So amazing. All that is such great science, and it's really moving exploration forward. And what's your role now at NASA headquarters? Now I am working for the Science Engagement and Partnerships Division under the Science Mission Directorate and I manage the day-to-day -day operations of the science.nasa.gov website. So how can we get our science out to the widest possible audience? And right now, we're focused more on this special project where we're modernizing and we're reducing our footprint and improving the user experience to our website. That's so important, that whole piece of how we communicate what we do to the public to engage and inspire. And so what advice do you give to young women when you meet them? I think the best advice I can give is to figure out what you love to do. Because if you're, if you get a job doing that, then you won't work a day in your life. And more importantly, don't let others' expectations of you, of what you, they think you should be doing, don't let that sway you from your dreams because you have the power to make it happen. That was such an amazing conversation. You know, she is so inspiring to me. I just can't believe what girls must think when they come in here and see these statues and get inspired by these women. I'm just so inspired, not only as a scientist, as a leader, but also as a father of a daughter who's also thinking about science as a future and as one that tries to inspire many others. I'm just so proud of them and excited for what this exhibit can do in so many lives. Well, at the Smithsonian, we're mostly used to celebrating women from history. But what I love about this exhibit is that we're celebrating women right now who are making such a difference. And that's really exciting to me. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to the next episode of Easy, Easy Science. Science.